The Cube at IBM Impact 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsor IBM. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Paul Gillen. Okay, welcome back everyone here live in Las Vegas for IBM Impact. This is Silicon Angle's The Cube, our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. Join my co-host, Paul Gillen with Silicon Angle. And our next guest is uh, VJ Deep, global product manager at IBM, covers big data, security, cloud. Um, some boring areas right now in the technology area, VJ, you know, cloud, big data, security. I mean, come on. I mean. <laughs> we just heard there's 400,000 yeah. employees. It seems like you got stuck with an awful lot. Well. Our job is to make sure that we have visibility across our security posture uh, and also help our org customers get complete visibility over their security postures. Yeah, I don't, you don't have to hear the terms big data and security put together. What, uh, what is the message there? Well, one of the interesting things is that security has always been a big data challenge because you have thousands of IT systems. You have hundreds of business application systems. If you want to know how your organization can potentially be compromised, you have to have visibility over those. So you're talking I mean, about big data, about uh, taking in uh, uh, law, uh, event logs and all kinds of, of data about what's going on in your exactly, network. And, and using exactly, exactly. Log events and network activity between people, their applications, how data flows within your organization. If you have visibility over it, you can then look at how to best protect it. By, being, by allowing security to be a business enabler and not just a oversight uh, hurdle. So we cover the big data space pretty heavily on SiliconANGLE, Wookie Bond, and the Cube. Mm -hmm. All the Hadoop worlds and Hadoop summits. We'll be at the Hadoop summit this year again with um, the Horton Works. We always talk about big data with you know, security and fraud. I get that. You can see someone's in Vegas with their cell phone, so if there's a withdrawal in another area, yep. you can tie those together. We've had Abhi Mehta on, former Bank of America, now uh, the founder of Trisada. Mm -hmm. Real big in financial services. So you know, obviously retail's another um, lucrative territory yeah. to stake out. you news recently. <laughs> <You're probably laughs> but I want you to uh, answer the question of the difference between um, big data and security using big data around security, mm -hmm. and how that's different from some of the tools out there around market intelligence and, and business, BI or business intelligence. Because you know, data warehousing and business intelligence has been around for a while, right, right. Um, which is, you know, we've always come into the slow, lagging, mm -hmm. kind of parked out in the hinterlands of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. But there are some cool market intelligence BI stuff out there, but how is that different from some of the stuff you're working on? Well, in security, one of the most important parameters is time. So imagine this, you have two developers or two analysts and you spend, let them for two weeks go at the data. In market intelligence or business intelligence, they come out with one new idea, it justifies their investment. In security, they spend two weeks, come back with one item to investigate, they might have been better allocated somewhere else, maybe even set up a- Or they might have missed some things. They might have missed a lot. Yeah. And time is of the essence. So one of the things that I like to tell customers about the difference of big data is that you got to treat big data uh, for security like a museum. You have to curate the data that you can best impact the outcomes for your security investigation. And if you take that into account, um, everything else will start falling into place. Look, looking at what type of reports you got to do, what type of uh, investigative behavior you want to enable. But you will need to provide direction. You need to provide focus that you may not need Actually, sometimes it might be restrictive in the context of business intelligence or market intelligence. So, so, on the, so just, let's just dig, drill into that a little bit. So sure. um, let's take the heart bleed, obviously, a big, mm -hmm. big trending item. Yeah. Um, impact is significant. Mm -hmm. What could have been done differently to catch that with using big data? Because uh, that's a little bit different kind of approach, but still it's an application vulnerability that might fit into a large enterprise. It scares the hell out of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, how would you dig into that and say, you know, because that, do you curate, you don't know what to curate, it's not a, in the museum analogy, it's like that hasn't yet to be an exhibit. Plus it left no, no, tra no trace. Yes. So, uh, in the case of, uh, I'll talk about from a response standpoint, being able to respond to something as pervasive a threat to your organization or your operations is to be able to, making sure that all your business critical applications, your business critical systems that are externally uh, focused, externally surfaced, being able to, if you're getting information from those, those are more important data sources than 
uh, other uh, potentially less critical items um, in, inside your organization. So being able to make sure that you understand your organization, understanding where within your organization uh, your reputation, your operations are at most risk, and being able to make sure that that data is analyzed first so that you can very quickly respond to something like Heartbleed. Now from a detection standpoint, being able to curate data that you get from government um, uh, investigators, being able to get it from teams like IBM X-Force who are doing the research and notify it. One of the interesting things is today, even with organizations building up their capacity to incorporate security and security awareness, we still get most of our awareness of new incidents or new threats from external parties. So if that's the case, I need those data sources that allow me to very quickly know what the new threats are so I can respond to it very effectively. Uh, you, one, and that's part of the data curation. One of the problems with, with analyzing that large amount of, of uh, security data is, is knowing what to look for. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like an ideal application of Watson. So are we seeing, are, are, are you creating security applications for Watson specifically? So uh, Watson is a logical uh, next step. Uh, one of the things is that from a maturity standpoint, we are still building out the concept, uh, the security knowledge that we need to codify into, uh, human knowledge that we can codify into, into a machine. And I think we're not there yet. Um, uh, once we have that corpus of information, and one of the interesting things about security is that it's always a cat and mouse game. So once you codify something, the attacker adapts. In, so take that in contrast to something like medicine. Once you learn something, once the system learns something, um, uh, it, it is the able virus, to apply it right, over and right. over again. Um, but whereas in security, we need to build not just cognitive capabilities, but also uh, learning or adaptive capabilities uh, incorporated within the parameters of what a security threat vector might look like. But you must be working with some government agencies on yes. this right now. I mean, using that kind of Watson technology, I think they'd be all over this. Yes, and I said that's that's the direction we're headed. <laughs> but not a commercial but, product at this point. Um, and one of the things, it's a point in time statement, right? Uh, Watson played Jeopardy just a few years ago, and now we're, it's finding, um, uh, it's diagnosing cancer better than most doctors, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll get there, and uh, we're, we're working on it. The, uh, now, in terms of big data, are you are you does your area of coverage cover big data in general, or are you specific to the security domain? So it is the intersection of big data and security that we typically focus on. Uh, everything from uh, being able to do predictive analysis on uh, exploring what parts of your organization might be most susceptible to risk, to analyzing which parts of your organization have the most significant amount of vulnerabilities directing your team to invest time and effort to uh, mitigate the most high risk vulnerabilities, but also from an incident response standpoint, how you can improve the time to, um, time to addressing a solution from a cyber forensics standpoint. Now Roger Ray was on theCUBE yesterday, he was talking mm -hmm. about uh, info streams. This seems like uh, sort of the, the, the core of your security big data strategy right now would be real time analysis. Is that, is that where you're, you're directing your, your marketing focus right now? Or is that a sidelight to, to the bigger data analytics business? So within the, uh, within the IBM security portfolio, the, uh, the security intelligence platform that we currently have is Curator. It is a real-time and a near real-time solution. And it works in conjunction with streams in, the, in a form that streams can help unify uh, physical security, like from your cameras, multimedia content from audio, and merge it with cybersecurity data for like log events and NetFlow. But cybersecurity data is all processed and um, managed by Curator. And our part of our big data initiative in security is to unify all of this data so that there are no data silos. So you can look and analyze all of this information as one coherent whole. Are you working with the uh, infrastructure providers like Cisco to, to, get, uh, to get a closer look inside their systems to be able to, to, to analyze that event data in real time? Uh, so, uh, absolutely. We work with over 2,000 different partners uh, who provide uh, device, IT devices, security devices, to be able to, that's how we essentially uh, uh, allow our customers to get visibility on what the con uh, risk, uh, um, ri uh, how to manage risk based on the configuration of certain devices, firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, how they've configured their web servers. So all of this information, we are, 
are basically first collecting, assessing. We have over uh, uh, six to eight years worth of security knowledge that we apply to it because we not only correlate all this data, but we add causation. So uh, that um, to resolve causation, we need to take all this correlated information and ha add that insight that we have developed to guide security organizations to uh, work on situations, is incidents or offenses, that are most pertinent to their organization today. Uh, and you said that security is a moving target and the, mm -hmm. the bad guys are always, are always morphing uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, to move in another direction. What trends are you seeing right now? I mean, where are the secure, where are the new vectors of security threat right now? Yes, um, I think I, I like to call it like we're in the age of the cyber offensive. And maybe, uh, the reason for that is regulations haven't caught up. Um, building up a corpus of uh, an evidence co um, corpus of data. Uh, we don't know how much to prove to identify. It's harder to bring people to um, to prove that they did something. And also, from a defense standpoint, we are at a situation where uh, we have too many open, uh, open switches. We're moving into social, we're moving into mobile and cloud. Um, and given the dynamism of our business environment, we're in a situation where attackers can pick the time and place. Moving forward, what, uh, where I see is that uh, the um, historical low and slow attacks um, we also have more of zero day type attacks uh, that can, but mainly it's, we're migrating beyond the kitty attacks, the opportunistic attacks, where attackers want to derive return on investment from their attack. They're spending time and effort, so now they want to be compensated. And how do they get compensated? And that actually helps us as defenders uh, to identify what impacts our risk, impacts our reputation, impacts our, um, our business and what, how attackers can potentially glean monetary value from it, and maybe that's where we allocate our defenses. So you narrow down more your exactly. vectors that you're looking at. Exactly. So I got to ask you about the, uh, the DevOps culture and, and then tie that into security, because I think mm -hmm. the cloud has proven that with the, with the, uh, the, the emerging web scale companies like you know, Google, Facebook, yeah. Yahoo, uh, Amazon, you know, the, the super geeks can build their own stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's, that horse has left the barn, so to speak. Um, but that really drove the DevOps culture, which is now going mainstream. Security is a similar kind of discipline. <laughs> you yep. gotta, it's like, you can't just take a, someone who programs Mongo, who's a Rails developer, mm -hmm. be like, okay, make him a security expert, because mm -hmm. you know, they're like LAMP stack developers, they're not really that sophisticated. Yep. Um, so, is there a security ops model that's going to come that's similar to DevOps, where, the, where from a development standpoint, you can have security as code, meaning um, in, um, um, I'm coding apps and deploying security stuff without being a security expert? Very good question. And this is, uh, we, found, we first identified this challenge in the mobile space. Mobile developers were not as security aware or security uh, seasoned as system developers. And suddenly they were writing a plethora of applications and for application, business applications. So the idea there is how can we uh, deliver confidence to, uh, by, by facilitating tools, assets that they can reuse. A developer, a mobile app developer doesn't need to uh, re rebuild how cryptography is done, or rebuild PKI infrastructure. So what we've done is, um, in our Trustier portfolio, we now deliver a security SDK that mobile developers can incorporate into their mobile app without uh, having to rebuild a wheel every time they build a new app. Similarly, for um, when we look at it from an infrastructure standpoint, how uh, step-up authentication, uh, how biometrics can be employed, We've done significant amounts from identity as a perimeter, so that these basic concepts can be very quickly incorporated by a developer without having them to learn the depth. But you see that security. as a big trend right now. Absolutely. Secure ops in a way, if you, yes. for lack of a better, <laughs> it's probably a term mm -hmm. out there, but. Uh, okay, so where is that? Is it early stages, national anthem, first inning, first pitch? <laughs> I think no we're, <laughs> security as a field, we're just getting started. Um, and it's a new mindset where security has to become uh, a, a, an enabler. Uh, it, it's, it can't be just policy and restrictions, because if people now, because user experience is so important, people either find ways around it or not participate. And security can't afford that. Uh, we're talking about social, we're talking about cloud. So we need to uh, design in security into every aspect of our operations, uh, whether it's uh, into our access management, whether it's into our applications, whether it's uh, how we transmit data, um, and make it 
sometimes abstract it out from the developers, abstract it out from, uh, so that you can, you can empower and enable security behind the covers. VJ, we'd like to have you on again. This is a great topic, certainly very relevant and very important. Um, seeing just the business loss alone with some bad security, just mm -hmm. the heartbleed is just a great poster child right now. It's yep. fresh on everyone's mind. That's just one of many examples that's happening on a daily basis. It's now a boardroom conversation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the kids in the dorm room to the boardroom are, are, are security, uh, are potential leaks and, and opportunities to fix. So um, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we have, my pleasure. We have to take a break, we'll be right back with our next guest after this uh, break. It's live in Las Vegas for IBM Impact, it's theCUBE.